Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night piano with the preacher. Our first hymn is 521, Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It. If you have the green songbook, 521. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. His child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. On the last verse, I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Amen. Now turn over to page 170. This song was requested. These last two songs have been requested. And uh, one day, I call this song the doctrine song. There's so much uh, doctrine and biblical truth in this song. And uh, you really can't skip a verse on this one. So stay with us. There are five verses. Tells the story of Jesus and uh, his resurrection and called One Day. So let's join together 170. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. Living He loved me, dying He saved me. Buried He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified freely forever. One day He's coming, oh glorious day. Verse 3, one day they left him alone in the garden. One day he rested from suffering free. Angels came down o'er his tomb to keep vigil. Hope of the hopeless, my Savior is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had come. Conquered, now is ascended, my Lord evermore. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. 
and the last verse tells the rest of the story. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day my beloved one's bringing. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Amen. I'm looking forward to that day and we're one day closer than we were yesterday. 371 a song of meditation, a song of, of uh, thinking through our standing with God and His position as the master and the potter, and we are the clay. Have thine own way, 371. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Verse 4, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit, till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. It's a great song, a prayer really put to music. This next song is not in our green hymnal. Uh, 30 years ago, this year, Teresa and I will mark our 30th anniversary, Lord willing, in November. And um, uh, when I first met her at the Bible Baptist Church of Mount Orb, Ohio, a shout out to all our uh, Mount Orb friends. A lot of them are watching tonight. And um, I met Teresa and uh, over the years as a music minister and uh, just being in church and ministry, uh, this came to be one of her favorite songs. It's called Mansion Over the Hilltop. Mansion Over the Hilltop. Not in our hymnal uh, that I know of, but if you know the song, sing along with me. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder, we will never more wander. But walk on streets that are purest gold. Though often tempted, tormented and tested, and like the prophet, my pillow a stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where 
will never grow. And someday yonder, we will never more wander, but walk on streets that are purest gold. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of that city. I want a mansion, a harp and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander, but walk on streets that are purest gold. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander, but walk on streets that are purest gold. Amen. I'm looking forward to that day. Uh, singing that song, thinking about Mount Oreb, Ohio and Bible Baptist Church made me think of my friend Priscilla Carter and the song that she taught me. Shout out to Priscilla Carter. And she taught me this song and I think it'll be a joyful chorus. It's just a simple chorus. I've never been sorry that I trusted his name. If you know it, sing with me. I've never been sorry that I trusted his name. Every moment I find him exactly the same. My soul has been singing since the Savior came. And I've never been sorry that I trusted his name. I've never been sorry that I trusted his name. Every moment I find him exactly the same. My soul has been singing since the Savior came. And I've never been sorry that I trusted his name. One more time. I've never been sorry that I trusted his name. Every moment I find him exactly the same. My soul has been singing since the Savior came. And I've never been sorry that I trusted his name. I hope you've trusted his name. You'll never be sorry. Join us now as Pastor Paul Long brings our second lesson in the series on the book of Romans. I know it'll be a blessing to you and a joy as we continue our study of this very important book of the Bible, the book of Romans, and we'll see you again soon. God bless you. Good evening. Uh, looking forward to this uh, online message for Wednesday night. Uh, the lesson title is Guilty. Guilty, and we are going to be starting in Romans chapter 1, verse number 18. So Romans chapter 1, verse 18. While you are turning there, I would like to thank you all who prayed for me and my wife. Uh, I am doing much better now. I have been out of the hospital three weeks as of yesterday and been back at work for two weeks. Uh, but we do greatly appreciate your prayers. Now, let's look at the scripture and see what it has to say. Paul was writing to uh, the church in Rome, and he was writing to a multi-ethnic generation and co uh, congregation, and this was comprised of primarily two groups. There were the Jews, and then there was everybody else. The Jews, of course, thought they were special because they were God's chosen people, so uh, all the other uh, nationalities were lumped into one group, uh, and we call them Gentiles. 
So anyone who was not a Jew, regardless of nationality, was considered a Gentile. This contact passage focuses on how all people, and I mean all, are guilty of sin, whether or not they have been exposed to the Mosaic law or not. God shows no favoritism. Romans 3.23, which we'll be studying here soon, says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, let's read verses 18 through 20, and then we will break it down. Verse number 18 says, For the wrath of God... Now, that's not a very popular subject today, but... It is a truth that God is also a God of wrath. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. And listen to this last part. So that they are without excuse. While all are guilty of sin, they are without excuse. And let's look at why. It says, Even persons who have never been exposed to Scripture have an innate understanding of wrongdoing. Because sin expresses itself in contrast to God's righteous character, no one who is unsaved can avoid avoid encountering the wrath of God. Many people feel uncomfortable thinking about the wrath of God. We'd rather focus on His love and compassion, but God's wrath articulates His love. God's wrath and God's love are perfectly balanced. Now that uh, that can't be truly said of men, but God can. It says His action, His wrath, seeks to turn us away from sin, which leads to death. Now, ungodliness involves an irreverence toward God. Unrighteousness includes actions of injustice and wrongdoing. The inclusion of the adjective all emphasizes that no sin escapes God's judgment. Every sin, however slight we think it to be, offends the righteousness of God. And of course, that goes all the way from someone committing murder, uh, from abortion, all the way to the little white lies that we tell from time to time. That um, That affects the righteous nature of God. Now, let's also look, it says here, the phrase, that which may be known, does not intend to define every aspect of God. Uh, In these verses, we see the general revelation of God, and we see it uh, in verse 19 and 20. It says, "...because that which may be known of God is manifest in them." That refers to the conscience. Every person born has a conscience. Now, over time, we can sear that conscience so that we do not respond, as we did in earlier days, uh, to sin in our life. But every person born has a, has a conscience which determines what is right and what is wrong. Now that is, of course, influenced by our environment and our upbringing, but every person is born with a conscience. And that conscience leads them through the general revelation to believe that there is a moral being who determines what's right and wrong. In addition to the conscience, we have creation. And in creation we can see that there is a Creator. Because of the intricacies and the complexity of creation, just in the human body itself, it leads us to believe that there is a Creator. You cannot have a clock without having a clockmaker. You cannot have an automobile without having a manufacturer. So creation, in all its complexity, diversity, um, indicates to us that there is a creator. Now, general revelation cannot point us to does not point us to salvation. General revelation points us to the fact that there is a God. But through special revelation, special revelation points us to the savior. There there are two aspects of special revelation. Number 1 is scripture. That's this right here. All scripture. 
is given by inspiration of God. That is special revelation. And it, it tells us not only that we're a sinner, but it tells us how to be saved. And in addition to the Scripture, of course, we have the Savior. The Savior is the greatest revelation of God to man. And in those two aspects of special revelation, Scripture and Savior, we have a way, we are taught we, a, a way to be saved. It says, Even as early humans gazed up into the stars or marveled at the majesty of the earth, they could not help but acknowledge the might of the Creator. And here's the thing. Objective observers, and that's the key, objective, recognize order and purpose that cannot merely occur by chance. As God reveals Himself in His creation, we have only one option, to acknowledge our accountability before Him and seek His forgiveness. And to me, that is the main, main reason why people reject Christianity and, and reject that God created this universe is this, they do not want to be held accountable to God. They are in rebellion. They only want to worship self. They do not want to be accountable to a holy and righteous God. Now, replaced by nonsense, verse 21 to 23, replaced by nonsense, verse 21 and 23, says, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now is that not a... Let's see, what's the word I'm looking for? Does that not point to today in America? People who profess themselves to be wise, and yet they are fools. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now, when confronted with the reality of God's righteousness, sinful people only have two choices. We can accept God as He reveals Himself and repent, or we reject Him and look for a substitute that does not make us feel guilty. God created us to worship something or someone. Pascal referred to it as a spiritual vacuum within each human being. And we are going to worship something. The question is, do we worship God who is worthy? Or do we worship something else? Whether it be an individual or uh, money or fame or whatever it may be. You say, well, Pastor Paul, we don't have idols today like they did back then. Idols of wood or, and, and you know, clay or whatever. Well, I beg to differ. While we don't have idols of wood and clay, although we do have tree huggers and dirt worshipers, so, but we what we do have are shows like American Idol, and we have TV and movie stars, sports players, of course, people who love money and power. These are the idols of today. Education, education is an idol of today by many people. I think, though, what we are seeing in this uh, special time that we are in in our country is that many of these uh, idols and TV and movie stars, sports players, are non-essential. And, and to me, that's a good thing. It says, since sin sinful humans cannot repudiate the majesty of creation, they must find a replacement for God that allows them to continue in sin. And in essence... Those who reject God are in essence worshiping themselves because they want to do what they want to do. And that's, that's the bottom line in most cases is that they are more concerned with themselves and being in rebellion than they really are listening to objective truth. It says rejecting God's truth leads to darkness and foolishness. And it says here over in uh, verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not, neither were thankful. But look at this. They became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. You know, that's the thing with sin. Sin may start out small, but like a snowball at the top of a mountain, it gains and it gets, wor gets bigger and bigger. And the sin is that way. It, it, a little sin can grow into a huge tree if left unchecked. And that is where 
uh, we are today. It says, creation rather than the creator becomes the object of worship. So now let's look at verses 24 to 28, and that's delivered over. Verses 24 through 28, uh, that is delivered over. Verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, these next verses deal with an issue that some in Christianity say is not addressed in the New Testament. There are those who are Christians who say, well, homosexuality isn't wrong. It's not mentioned anywhere in the New Testament that it is wrong. Well, if you run into someone like that, I, you need to take them to these verses in Romans. Starting in verse 26, for this, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. <coughs> Excuse me. These, these verses, these two verses, indicate, show beyond a shadow of a doubt that homosexuality is just as much a sin in the New Testament as it was in the Old Testament. <coughs> now, it says here, uh, the phrase for this cause harkens back to the issue of false worship mentioned in the previous verse. The improper attitude of people toward God results in corrupt relationships with one another. Natural relations involve a sexually exclusive relationship between a man and a woman in a marriage state. And we see in our society today, our society is promoting this in almost every TV show. We are seeing homosexuality in almost every TV show on, uh, on TV today. And <coughs> it is amazing to me how 20 years ago they would never have even shown anything like this. But in recent years it is becoming more and more prevalent. Now, so what's the next step after homosexuality that, that liberals are going to run into? Well, it could be uh, pedophilia. Uh, I don't know, but I can tell you this. Sin gets worse and worse. So what's the next step going to be? It says, moral depravity naturally results from rejecting God as Lord. While the Greek and Roman while the Greek and Roman cultures not only approved but endorsed homosexuality, Scripture calls this behavior detestable. One cannot disregard God without consequences. And we know, of course, in Romans 6.23 it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not com convenient. You know, there's, 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 a old, there's a saying about reaping and sowing. There's a truth. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. And you reap after you sow. And that, I think, is what God is saying in this verse, is that God gave them over to a reprobate mind. They began to reap the consequences of their sin, and it just got worse and worse. It says, denying the wisdom of God, they, they were left with the reprobate mind that sees good as bad and bad as good. That is our culture today. They promote everything that is morally bad, according to the Bible, and they promote it as good. And for those of us who are believers and try to have a moral standards to live by, they promote that as evil. Rejecting God leads to the devaluing of life. And we have seen that over the last 40 years in the abortion industry. When a state legislature 
can stand up and applaud when a uh, legislation on abortion is passed just shows how far America has fallen. Now, my final point, deserving death, we see in verse 32, we see in verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them. People who parade their wickedness illustrate the deceptive nature of sin. And again, people are in society today, people in the world are applauding sin. You know, one of the uh, key uh, words in today's society uh, is, is inclusion. We have to include everybody. No, we don't. No, we do not. We have to love everybody. Well, yes, we can love everybody, but that doesn't mean we love everything that they do. Uh, as I look at our society, and while I don't consider myself an old person, I am quickly approaching that age, I see how far we have drifted in society, in our morals, and it, it scares me. It really scares me to death because I, I look at my grandkids and I think, Lord, how much worse is it going to be as they grow older? How much worse is society going to be? And it's, it scares me. It really does. The only hope for America, the only hope for America is revival. Morally speaking, the only hope for America is revival. And perhaps one of the benefits, one of the silver linings to this uh, coronavirus is hopefully we will see more of God's people turn back to the Lord and be serious in their commitment to the Lord. Revival begins in the church. It begins in the church and then it spreads out to the community. And that's what we, the Church of America, needs is revival. It says, Today society thinks biblical ethics are overbearing and believe God's justice is harsh because having other people join their wrongdoing seems to validate, validate their behavior. They encourage other people to sin. They ignore the reality that refusing to honor God justifies a sentence of death. Instead of seeing God's discipline as an expression of His love, their degenerate minds substitute sensuality for love in the end, God's righteous justice will prevail. Only those who repent and seek forgiveness in Christ will find God's redeeming love. Well, I hope in this lesson uh, entitled Guilty, you, we have learned that God Himself has revealed Himself to us in nature through creation and through conscience that there is a God. We saw that in <coughs> verses 18 through 20, excuse me. We also saw where it was replaced by nonsense. Because mankind rejected God, they then started worshiping idols. And that idolatry pushed them further and further away from God. And finally, in verses 24 to 28, God delivered them over. He delivered them over to their reprobate mind. Um, as I mentioned earlier in that illustration about the snowball getting bigger and bigger, uh, the sin just escalates over time and gets, you know, it's like an, a, an addiction. You know, someone who's an alcoholic may just start out with one drink, and then before you know it, it's two drinks. And then to get the same effect that he used to get with one drink, he has to have ten drinks. It just gets worse and worse. God gave them uh, over, it says here. Ungodly thinking resulted in God giving them up to their uncleanness. Sexual immorality, homosexuality, a reprobate mind, all of that was a result of, God, of them rejecting God and then God giving them up. 
And finally, a deserving death, here this last point, verse 32. People who parade their wickedness illustrate the deceptive nature of sin. It says they have pleasure in them that do them. They applaud open-minded people. And they call us Christians closed-minded. But that is our society today. Well, I want to thank you for the privilege of teaching. I do greatly miss uh, the church uh, gathering together here at 4700 Skittle Way and, and worshiping together. I greatly miss uh, teaching Sunday school, but hopefully soon we will be able to uh, start, start the process of getting back into our local church here. Thank you.